Hello and welcome to episode 447 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert, as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm good. Apologies for the missing of a, a show last week. So Andy and I were due to do a podcast last week, but unfortunately I was too ill to actually record the show. Funnily enough, we did put out on socials that there was an episode that was released. So obviously preempting the show <laughs> social media had already been planned and so people were writing on the instagram post where is it it's not been downloaded it's four o'clock i can't see the episode so apologies for that obviously i did write on there and explaining where the show was but i'm yeah i'm back and uh, it's good to be back and the other thing if you are watching us in the studio now so we are producing more of these podcasts and put them on youtube you will notice that andy's very happy because he's changed our studio look so there's nice lighting and all sorts of things so andy's like a kid in a sweet shop aren't you yeah. i'm absolutely loving it i'm playing around with blue lights and red lights and we've got overhead lights and we're getting rid of we used to have terrible shadows behind us but we've got rid of them now so i'm a happy boy so don't forget do make sure you go on the YouTube channel because all of our podcasts are put on there automatically anyway as a feed. So no visual, just as a feed. So you can write comments on there and we will respond to them. So it's quite an instant way to communicate with Andy and myself. Or of course, there will be inevitably a video of the podcast normally later in the week where you can actually watch the show being recorded. So do look at those and subscribe to the channel. Indeed. So let's get on with what we're talking about this week. It's three pieces as usual, I'm assuming. What have we got? So I am conscious there's been no investment pieces for a week or two. So I wanted to make sure everybody was still on their toes. So just before Christmas, I ran a quiz. So it's a multiple choice quiz. It was totally unexpected, but it did get a lot of positive feedback. People enjoyed the idea of doing a quiz once in a while. So I thought I'd do a, an investment quiz. So I'm going to be pulling up random questions. A lot of it's to do with jargon. There are some easy ones in there, some slightly tricky ones, but it's related to investing. So see how you get on, feedback how you much you enjoy the quiz or otherwise. The other piece I'm going to do is there's been a big piece of news about another PPI style claim that could be happening so an event where people on mass so millions of people could be entitled to claim compensation but this is to do with car finance and the final piece on the podcast andy you're going to be doing I'm going to be talking about tax returns. Now, the 31st of January is the date that you need in terms of your online submissions. That's been and gone. So I'm actually going to cover a piece talking about what happens if you file your submissions late. So only a short piece on that, but it'll be interesting because a record 1.1 million people missed that deadline. And if you look at the number of people who missed the deadline compared to the number of people who submitted a tax return, you're talking about about 10% of people missed the deadline. So it is something that's going to impact quite a few listeners, probably. So let's kick on with the first piece of the podcast. I'm going to skip straight to actually the piece about car finance. So it's going to impact a lot of people in the UK. So I'm going to give you the background and what you might have to do or could do to potentially make a claim in relation to the selling of car finance. Now, I don't like ambulance chasing stories, but this blew up a couple of weeks ago and it was always going to have to be done on the podcast because there was a, a ruling that was made, well, not ruling, but an announcement by the FCA. So that's the Financial Conduct Authority. That's the body that regulates the financial services industry. And obviously it does therefore regulate car finance. And they made an announcement they're going to be looking at how complaints about car finance have been handled. And the announcement has the result resemblance of what occurred pre-PPI. So if you remember, there was the PPI where people were sold insurance on whether they'd be able to protect payments in the past and they didn't necessarily want it. So you may, many years ago, had a credit card, you were paying an insurance you didn't even realise as part of your repayments and you probably were never going to be able to claim on it. So that scandal cost the industry billions, got to pay compensation. Martin Lewis has now come out and said that this car finance mis-selling has the potential to be similarly huge. So I want to run through what's occurred and just to give people an idea because it will impact a lot of people. So to give you some details, prior to January 2021, there were lenders, so people who provided the car finance and car dealers acting as brokers. So you'll see that or you'll hear that term interchange, brokers and car dealers that used something called discretionary commission arrangements to sell potentially unfair finance deals to customers. Now, 
the way it worked is that the discretionary commission arrangements allowed the car dealer, for example, if you went in to arrange car finance and you were going to buy a new car, that the lender may approve the car finance based upon a interest rate. They might give you a range. That range was given to the car dealership, not to you. The car dealership, for example, acting as a broker for that car finance could then say to you, yep, you've been approved, but the rate you're going to be charged is X. And that rate could be at the top end of the range that the lender was happy to lend to you. But the key thing about it was that the amount of commission they earned was dictated by the amount that you were going to be paying. So right. therefore, they would inevitably lead to some dealerships offering car finance at the highest rates of interest because they'd actually earn more commission. And so that has been deemed unfair. And there's been a number of complaints. It's not just one or two. We're talking about thousands and thousands of people have complained. So back in 2021, the FCA actually banned the practice because of concerns. But what's happened, the Financial Ombudsman Service, so FOSS, for short, which is the independent arbitrator of financial complaints, so between the financial services companies and consumers, they've been contacted by thousands of people who are unhappy about complaints in relation to the car finance deals that were sold prior to January 2021. And people felt they'd been treated unfairly because they'd been basically overcharged for car finance. So what happened? People complained to the dealership, for example, and widely those complaints had been rejected. And so what people then do is take a complaint to the financial ombudsman service. So there's certain rules that have to be adhered to by the companies if you make a complaint. They have a certain periods of time in which they have to respond to your complaint and then you can go to the financial ombudsman service. So they can then look at it and they can make a decision which is binding with the financial company. So there were a couple of cases that involved this discretionary commission arrangement that the FOSS ruled on recently that have now caused this whole mis-selling to be looked at. So there was a case called Mrs. Y versus Black Horse. And the case was that Mrs. Y purchased a car on finance. Now, the company that sold the car offered to arrange the finance and act as a broker. And the lender, so Black Horse, was prepared to offer her a flat interest rate of between 2.49% and 5.5% for the car finance arrangement. However, any amount above 2.49% would have resulted in a higher commission for the broker arranging the deal. So you're talking about the car dealership. Now, the broker decided to charge Mrs. Y an interest rate of 5.5% to collect the highest possible commission. And upon finding out, Mrs. Y complained that this was unfair and requested compensation. Well, the ombudsman eventually upheld Mrs. Y's complaint and ordered Black Horse to pay Mrs. Y compensation as a result. And in making that decision, the ombudsman claimed that Black Horse had failed to act fairly and reasonably on several occasions. Now, I'll put a link in the notes of this show to an article where we explain all of this, what I'm talking about. And it also contains a link where you can go and read the result of that particular case yourself. But therefore, what that means is that started to raise questions about how other people had been treated similarly and unfairly. And of course, the issue with this discretionary commission arrangement is that they weren't having to tell you that the discretionary commission arrangement was occurring and that you could have had it at a lower rate. So there are lots of people out there who would have had car finance. They may have even paid the car finance off now where they were in a similar situation and were totally unaware that this had occurred, that they would effectively paid more than they needed to for car finance because the dealership, the broker wanted to make more commission. The whole practice seems wholly unfair. I mean, when you're in a dealership, you see a car you like, you sold the dream, then you're given the breakdown of the payments each month and kind of there's probably something inside most people that thinks this is the deal I'm getting. Is this the fair? And yeah, you will often try and push for a better deal, but you're not assuming that they're just inflating these costs for their own gain. Yeah, and most people would never look at the finance part and think there was a deal to be had that you can negotiate there. That seems to be part of the sound. And we've all been into car dealerships. And I don't want to just cast aspersions on the whole industry, but having bought cars in the past, obviously they're very keen for you to take out finance. And obviously you can understand why, because there were the commission element. Now, as we've mentioned earlier in the podcast, the FCA have since banned the practice, but the 
context of the or the size of the problem that we could be facing 90 percent of all new cars are bought on finance every year and now the average amount financed ranges between fifteen thousand five hundred and twenty five thousand pounds and so you look at the car finance debt pile since 2009 it's about 29 billion pounds so the point is the scale of the potential mis-selling is enormous so what the fca are doing is they're now looking into the industry into the complaints how they've been handled they're doing a review to see if there's a widespread mis-selling and of course if there is then you could likely see a ppi style compensation regime happening so if you remember everybody was then writing in the scene if they had ppi claiming compensation for the mis-selling and so that would open up the floodgates so one of the questions people will naturally have is does it affect them now the mis-selling review may affect you if you had car finance before the 28th of january 2021 and specifically customers who used a higher purchase agreement such as a pcp arrangement to buy the car so that's personal contract purchase it's also likely to affect those who used a lender or a car dealership acting as a broker who had a discretionary commission arrangement so it's important there was a discretionary commission arrangement part that's where the issue lies so the investigation that's occurring is unlikely to affect people who bought a car after 2021 january 28th 2021 because the rules stopped the kind of practice where you could have these discretionary commission arrangements that could end up favoring the car dealership without you knowing and it also won't apply to people who use the hire arrangement so personal contract hire because you weren't buying the car you didn't have the option to buy the car at the end you were effectively renting the car so they won't be impacted so there are temporary complaint handling rules have been put in place because what's happened the fca have obviously realized there could be a potential problem they've got to review the scenario to see the scale of the problem and so they've put in rules to stop a flood of complaints in because obviously companies now are currently dealing with people who are complaining about these discretionary commission arrangements and what's happened unfair practices before 2021 so we'll put a link in the notes of this show so you can see what the rules are are but essentially it gives the companies longer to deal with complaints now and it limits the ability of people to file new complaints that will fall under the sort of regime that they're looking at but it doesn't stop you making the complaint so why would they put these temporary rules in well the answer is they want the existing complaints to be dealt with in a consistent and efficient way so they ensure that occurs but does it mean that if you haven't complained now that if there is a review then you will miss out and the answer is well likely to be no so it is suggested that the first thing people should do because there'll be people listening to this podcast and in fact it'll probably be most people will have taken out a car or bought a car on car finance in the last decade and so if it was before that date in 2021 then there's a very good chance for example if you had pcp that you could be impacted so one thing you can do is to contact your car finance company and you could email them and find out if a discretionary commission arrangement was used on your car finance deal and also find out details of the arrangement if it existed so that's step one so this is very reminiscent of the ppi days where you were able just to write to companies and say well was i sold ppi and this is like the first step then you need to give them an opportunity to respond and reply then of course if there was a discretionary commission arrangement which you would be unlikely to know about then you could start to lodge a complaint and the thought process is that if we do end up having this wider review where people can make complaints and can ask for compensation much like ppi then at least you've lodged your complaint in the system and it's going to be potentially looked into now of course if you complain there are rules that people have to follow so i'm talking about the lenders here and the brokers to respond to your complaint and you can go to the financial ombudsman service FOSS if you're unhappy with what they come back with so as I've mentioned I'm linking to an article that gives you all the details about this potential issue the potential for redress and it'll give you all the details in it but ultimately what happens next is the big question so the FCA are looking into this they're reviewing the situation and if they find there has been widespread misconduct and it led to consumers losing out then they'll work out ways to ensure consumers receive compensation in a consistent way now that like i said has very much the hallmarks of ppi so i don't like the concept i'm not encouraging people to ambulance chase but if the fca have 
found or they do find as elements of mis-selling, bear it in mind and you can in the meantime write to companies, find out if you had one of these arrangements in your car financing deals and at least you'll be armed if there is something more widespread and you can make a claim. And so as you mentioned there, Damien, we'll put a link to that in the show notes because it is a bit of an unfolding story at the moment. Obviously, as things unfold and we do get more information, we will update that article to make sure you do bookmark it. Yeah, and Martin Lewis is banging the drum on this one. So it is something that you are going to hear more and more about in the future if it seems like it probably will do, that there will be some kind of redress that's going to be coming people's way. And no doubt we will do an update on the podcast when we do hear more. So let's move on to the next piece of the podcast then. It's another Money to the Masses quiz. 13 questions this week. 13 questions and we do the Monday quiz after we've done a show so actually this probably supersedes it I, I think if we took five of the 13 I'm, I'm about to ask I'll be intrigued to see how many people don't get five out of five given that I'm going to give you the answers so I decided to do an investment quiz because people really enjoyed it and I think it's quite a good way of just having a brief recap of some of the things we talk about on the show it's also quite an easy quick way for me to give some insight some knowledge basically clearing up jargon that we might use we all fall into it i mean i i I admit that i might do every now and then say a phrase or word that people don't quite understand so these are somewhat unrelated questions but they're all investment related so we're going to kick straight on with them and the first one i've got is what is the primary factor that differentiates a growth stock from a value stock is it a the dividend yield b company size c stock price volatility or d future earnings potential i'll go for question two then damien so what does the term alpha signify in investment Is it A, the risk-adjusted performance of an investment compared to a benchmark? B, is it the annual dividend yield of a stock? C, is it the fixed interest rate on a bond? Or D, the correlation of a stock with the overall market? Question number three, what is the blue chip stock? Sorry, what is a blue chip stock, I should have said? Is it A, a stock with a blue logo? B, a new and rapidly growing company stock? Is it a stock from a large, well-established and financially sound company? Or is it a stock stroke share that is traded at a low price? Question four, in the context of bonds, what does duration measure? Is it A, the time it takes for a bond to mature? Is it B, the bond's sensitivity to interest rate changes? C, the annual interest payment of the bond? Or D, the credit rating of the bond? Uh, Question number five, what's the main characteristic of a junk bond? Is it A, low risk and low return? B, high credit rating? C, high yield due to high risk? Or is it D, a government issued bond? Question six, what does short selling involve? Is it A, selling stocks you own? Is it B, selling stocks you've borrowed? C, selling stocks at a short price? Or D, selling stocks quickly after buying? I know the answer to that one. (laughs) (laughs) I have got the answers in front of me, though, so I should. What is a hedge fund? Is question number seven. Is it a fund that invests only in commodities to hedge against inflation? Is it a private investment partnership with a flexible investment strategy? Is it a fund that guarantees fixed returns? Or is it D, a fund that invests only in shares? Question eight then, what does leveraging mean in terms of investing? Is it A, reducing investment risk? Is it B, investing only in leveraged buyouts? C, using borrowed money to increase potential returns? Or is it D, focusing on long-term investments? Okay, so we're on to question number nine. What is the main advantage of an ETF, which is an exchange traded fund, over a unit trust? Is it A, higher guaranteed returns? Is it B, the ability to trade like a stock on an exchange? Is it C, no management fees? Or is it D, fixed interest payments? Question 10, just four more to go. What is a REIT? R-E-I-T. Is it A, a fund that invests in real estate properties? Is it B, a government issued real estate bond? Is it C, a company that builds real estate properties? Or finally, D, a type of real estate insurance? And question number 11, what is pound cost averaging? Sometimes you hear it called dollar cost averaging. Is it A, investing a fixed amount to play the average move in the pound dollar exchange rate over a set period of time? Is it B, a strategy of investing a fixed amount at regular intervals regardless of market conditions is it c calculating the average cost of an investment in pounds or is it d a method to reduce investment risk in currency trading 
Question number 12 then, what is a put option in stock trading? Is it A, the option to put more money into a stock? B, the right to sell a stock at a predetermined price? C, is it the option to change stock brokers? Or finally, D, the right to buy a stock at a predetermined price? And the final question is number 13. What is diversification? It's a nice, easy one just to boost anybody who feels they've missed any questions. Is it A, investing in a variety of asset classes to reduce risk? Is it B, focusing on a single sector to maximise returns? Is it C, investing in international markets only? Or D, buying and selling assets frequently? So what we're going to do now is swap your papers <laughs> to make sure there's no cheating. Mark each other's homework. Andy will read out the question and I will just tell you what the answer was because I'll explain a little bit about each to give you some insight where it's needed. Okay, so going back to question one then, what is the primary factor that differentiates a growth stock from a value stock? So the answer was D, future earnings potential. Growth stocks typically are things, if you think about tech companies, often put into that category. One where the earnings could be way off in the future. And so they are seen as something that you'd invest in for the long term. But they do tend to have an earnings potential that is significant in the future, which is why when interest rates start to go up, when you discount it back, those earnings get smaller, which is why the share price starts to fall when interest rates go up. And interestingly, value stocks tend to be those which are deemed to be obviously good value based upon market expectations. So growth and value. OK, question two, then what does the term alpha signify in investment terms? So I picked this one because I did a piece of research for 8020 investor members this week, and it's something I've referred to even on the podcast in the last year. It is actually A, which is the risk adjusted performance of an investment compared to a benchmark. There's quite a few key statistics you can get for funds. You'll see alpha quoted. It's really a, a measure of manager skill, but you get others out there. You get beta, which is one which if you see the beta, that tends to show you how the fund's price is moving in relation to the market. If it's one, then it's a perfect correlation with the market. So if the market starts to move up and down, it kind of moves with it. So a lot of the performance price moves can be explained away by what the market does. So alpha, you want that figure to be as high as possible when you look at a fund fact sheet. Beta, you probably want it to be less than one. And there's others you could also look into, but that's a topic for another time. Okay, question three then, what is a blue chip stock? The answer on that one was C, which is a stock from a large, well-established and financially sound company. Now, the way to think about this, blue chip stocks often exist in equity income funds. So if you think about uh, a UK equity income fund in the UK equity income sector, they will tend to be companies that pay reliable dividends over time. So you'll often see things in there that occasionally will be pharmaceutical companies, for example. So they tend to be companies that are large, well-established and therefore financially sound because they can then pay reliable dividends. Question four then, in the context of bonds, what does duration measure? So this is something we talked about a lot, I think, in 2022, also last year. The answer in that one is B, the bond sensitivity to interest rate changes. So what that does, if you think about it in terms of the price of the bond, when interest rates go up, then it's a bit like a seesaw, then the price of the bond will go down. So if the duration, which is a function of time in a way, but the duration of the bond is actually a measure that means if it's higher, then it means that if interest rates go up, the price of that bond will fall more than something that's got a smaller duration. So fund managers manage duration risk. So in an environment where rates were going up, they actually shortened their duration. So it had less impact. When interest rates, you think they're going to fall. So for example, going into the future, you might start to see fund managers increasing their duration. So what it will do is it make them more sensitive to rate cuts, which will push the price of their bonds up even more. So have a look out for that in the future. Question five then, what is the main characteristic of a junk bond? So the answer to that was C, high yield due to high risk. So the word junk, it doesn't mean it's complete rubbish, but if you think of along those lines, the worse that perhaps the quality of the bond would be because of the companies that invest in, there's more risk, therefore you expect a higher yield as saying they're junk companies. So high yield due to high risk. Okay, uh, question six, what does short selling involve? So that was B, selling stocks you have 
borrowed. And now what typically happens is in order to bet against the market and ethically, there are lots of people out there who don't like this. So if you think about it, someone's making money trying to force a stock to go down or the market to go down. And so there's a lot of people who ethically don't like the idea. How you actually short something is you could borrow the shares from somebody else. And typically that's from large pension funds or index funds. You borrow the shares, let's say in Apple, you pay them a premium for borrowing them. You then sell them, which drives the price down theoretically anyway. If lots of people are selling a stock, a share, the price will go down. And when the price goes lower, you buy them back and you give them back the same number of shares that you borrowed. And then everybody's happy you've made a profit minus the premium you've paid. And so what you find is that there are some companies that will ethically say, we won't take part in short selling. So they won't lend their stock to somebody else to be able to sell in that way. So therefore, they ethically don't think people should be betting against the market. So there is that odd thing, if you've got a pension fund that's doing it, in a way, they could be helping people drive the value of investments and crash it. So that is something to think about. Question seven, what is a hedge fund? It's nothing to do with hedging against inflation. It's basically B, a private investment partnership with a flexible investment strategy. You'll see lots of stuff to do with hedge funds in the US, but it's a company or investment partnership that will have a very flexible investment strategy. It can mean you get some outsized returns, but realistically, you can get some big losses as well. Question eight, then what does leveraging mean in terms of investing? The answer is C, using borrowed money to increase potential returns. So if you borrow money to then invest effectively, you can amplify your returns, but you can also amplify your losses. It is a trait that some investment trusts do because it's something investment trusts are allowed to do, effectively borrow money to invest. So it is C is the answer, using borrowed money to increase potential returns. Question nine, what is the main advantage of an ETF, which is an exchange traded fund over a unit trust? It's B, it's the ability to trade like a stock or share on an exchange. So if you think about that, that's a huge advantage because if you've got an ISA fund or a pension fund, typically they're unit trusts. And so they are traded and priced once a day. So if the market was to crash and you put in a request to sell, you don't know the price you're going to get until the next day, probably around about midday, each fund will dictate Tate or tell you the pricing point for their unit trust. That's the price you would get. Then the trade will go through and you'll also be out the market during that point. You don't get that with investment trusts and ETFs. You can trade them throughout the day and you also know the price you're going to get. Question 10 then, what is a REIT? R-E-I-T. The answer is A, a fund that invests in real estate properties. Moving on to question 11 then, what is pound cost averaging? That is actually B, a strategy of investing a fixed amount at regular intervals regardless of market conditions. So that is where, think of it, if the market is falling, you might decide to put in a set amount. Let's say it was £1,000 a month. If you had a big lump sum, £12,000 you want to invest over a year. Rather than do it all up front, you did £1,000 a month. Then if the market starts to fall, you're just getting more more of the shares or units in the fund that you want to invest in for your money. And when the market eventually recovers, then obviously you will benefit more. Whereas if you put your money in all up front, then all that money would be hit from the big fall that you had in that particular price of the investment that you were investing in. So it's great for trying to protect if you think there's going to be a downside in markets. Of course, it has the opposite effect. If markets suddenly rally, you'd be better off putting your money up front. So it's a strategy that people will try to use in any market condition when investing. Question 12 then, what is a put option in stock trading? It's B, the right to sell a stock at a predetermined price. And finally, question 13, what is diversification in investing? We made a nice, easy one to finish with. Well, we would hope after many years of listening to the Money to the Masses podcast, we cover diversification quite a lot in various topics. And the answer is A, of course, which is investing in a variety of asset classes to reduce risk. So I hope you enjoyed that quiz. We will try and do them from time to time because I think people learn quite a lot. Also, they highlight holes in their knowledge. But I also like the idea that you may have heard something there and wanted to go and find out a bit more about it. So if you want to do that, then do go on the Money to the Masses website and you can search in the search function and find out more information about any of those topics.
Fantastic. Okay, so let's move on to the final piece of the podcast then. And we're going to be talking about self-assessment. Now, a record 11.5 million people submitted their tax return or were due to submit their tax return by the 31st of January. And we are just past that now as this podcast comes. And there's news to say that 1.1 million people missed that deadline. So we thought it might be a good piece just to cover off what that means for people. Yeah, so that's right. Initially, you're going to get a £100 fine if you don't file a return and you should have done. Yeah, well, there is a £100 fine, absolutely. But you do have the right to appeal if you have a reasonable excuse. As to what a reasonable excuse is, well... Not dog ate your homework. <laughs> no, not dog ate your homework. But if you do have a reasonable excuse, then you will potentially be let off that fine. So you'll initially be hit with a £100 fine. And then if it rumbles on... After three months, you'll have to pay an extra £10 per day fine up to a maximum of £900. So really, three months is the key deadline date there. If you've already missed the deadline, OK, you might have to swallow £100. Try and get your act together, get get all your paperwork in order and hit that three month deadline. So really, by April, you should be looking to, if you want to minimise the fines you're going to be getting, make sure that you get your your return done by then. If you're six months late, you'll face another penalty of 5% of the tax due or £300. And it's based on whichever is higher, whichever number is higher. And if you are looking further ahead, if you're a whole year late, you'll have another 5% charge or £300, whichever is higher. So you can see these fines are ratcheting up and up and up. So the message really is if you're late, it's not the end of the world. There will be an initial fine unless you've got a good excuse. But really, that three month window, get it in before April time. Yeah. So act as soon as you can. Don't bury your head in the sand. Learn from the lesson that you had done it in time and then turn over a new leaf. Do your tax return and then next year put a reminder in your diary because don't forget you get to the point once you've passed the end of the next tax year. So after the 5th of April this year, you can then theoretically submit your tax return at that point for the tax year that has just ended. So do make sure you do that. If you've got an accountant, they will start to badger you probably if they're any good. So don't wait until the 31st of January next year to start thinking about tax returns again, because obviously if you've missed it this year, there's a very good chance you're probably going to do the same thing next year. Yeah. And of course, if you've done the hard work and you've got yourself caught up, like you say, you could then submit the next one after the 5th of April. And and actually, you don't even have to pay the tax for the following tax year straight away. You can just get the job done. Yes, you submit the tax return and you still got plenty of time to actually then submit the tax. You can leave the money accruing interest in your own account. So the point is, you could still do the, the paperwork, file it and then set a reminder to actually pay the tax a good tip so i think that's it for this week andy we are done as ever if you've enjoyed the show please make sure you leave us a review on whatever podcast app that you use five stars is obviously what we're after if you're watching on youtube do hit that like button do ask questions and subscribe to the channel as ever do follow us on all the social media platforms that we're on i particularly like instagram at the moment we do normally do a quiz on a monday we probably won't do a quiz on monday actually no i think we could potentially see if i could squeeze something out of the other pieces who knows have a look out for a potential quiz on monday as well don't forget to join our facebook group facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash money to the masses and so i think that's it andy all that's left for us to do is to say until next time until next time oh.